Alrighty, so thank you for coming to the Beacon Orthopedic presentation on strength and conditioning for youth athletes. Um, uh, the, present, the presenter today is going to be Josh True from Beacon, an athletic trainer. Um, so he is here for your questions. If you have any, if you are on the virtual presentation through the WebEx, there is a chat box where you can enter any questions. I will keep an eye on it throughout the presentation and if a pop, question pops up, uh, I will kindly interrupt and ask the questions as they come in. Um, but I'm gonna let Josh take it over and I hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm gonna take my mask off so you can hear me better, present a little bit better. Um, thanks Katie, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks to the Cincinnati Sports Club for allowing us to use the facility. Um, so we're gonna talk today on the topic of uh, strength conditioning for youth athletes. Um, we're gonna talk about how we can build movement literacy and prevent injury in those types of settings. Um, so the first thing that I kind of want to discuss is, is we need to make sure that we have a, a clear definition of what strength training is, and what conditioning training is. So strength training um, uses a theory or a method called progressive overload to gradually increase loads or forces upon the body and the body will adapt to those, those uh, stresses placed upon it. It's a good tool to use to enhance your overall sports performance by improving your strength and your motor control. And then conditioning training uses methods to improve your cardiovascular or your VO2 max or, or anything kind of based upon you know, where you're going to do some type of running activity or cycling, anything that will increase your heart rate to improve your, your cardiovascular function. Um, so a lot of times what we do with uh, strength training and conditioning training is what we call the SED principle, which is specific ad adaptations to impose demands. So the body is a really smart machine. So you place specific stresses upon that body, it's going to adapt and try to enhance itself to do those movements or those activities more efficient, efficiently. So as soon as we get very efficient with things, then we can talk about being more proficient. So if we're very efficient and our proficiency comes and we don't have to use as much energy or, or any uh, unwanted movement patterns or anything like that to perform those activities. So, Efficiency is what we want first, and then we want to become very proficient in our, our exercise and our activities. Um, also, they say that, I mean, the old adage is practice makes perfect, and I agree with that partially. Um, I think the better way to say it is perfect practice makes perfect. Um, if we're not going to practice something the way that it's supposed to be done, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice, and if we're not training kids the way that it should be done, then I think we're setting them up for failure, whether it be injury or whether it be not getting the most out of the training or training session that you're looking for. Um, we just want to make sure that we want to train what we are, not train what we're not. So we're not going to have you know, a big football line and go out and run four miles for his condition. That, that makes no sense. When a football play is five, six seconds long, he needs to train repetitive bursts for those five or six seconds, maybe 10 seconds tops, just to kind of build a little bit more base. Or if we look at soccer players, they, they change pace all the time. You know, there's been some research out there that shows a college soccer player will run anywhere from six to ten miles in a game if they're a midfielder. Um, they'll because they can just go back and forth. But it's not all full speed training. It's not all just walking around. I mean, they're changing pace. They're going from a jog to a sprint, maybe to stand around for a couple seconds. Um, so train what you are is is what we need to really focus on when we design implement strength conditioning programs for, for young athletes. So the million dollar question, the, the main meat and potatoes behind this presentation, is is it safe to train youth using strength conditioning for young athletes? Can we, can we do that? And I'm, I will tell you that based upon research from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Strength Conditioning Association, they say that you can train kids as young as eight years old. To go back on that, we're not gonna have an eight-year-old hop on a bench press and lay down and put 200 pounds on a bar and have a bench press. That makes no sense. So we, we wanna make sure that we, when we do our strength conditioning that we want the program to be age efficient, age appropriate, um, and we wanna make sure that we get the goals out of the program that we're looking for. So we wanna make sure that we design it 
and implement their program to get the most benefit for that individual or for that group. We don't want to, you know, have people doing things that they're not ready to do or that they that they should not be doing. Um, and the, like I said, the body is a very adaptive mechanism. Um, it learns how to do things. You can have kids run out and play and give them a ball, and they're going to figure out what they're supposed to do with that ball. They're, they're going to figure out, okay, i got to use my foot to kick it, or i got to use this side of my foot to go this way. The, the body understands those kinds of things, and, and that's, that's what we need to really focus on, is age-appropriate and how we implement all those types of uh, programs. All right? um, and you'll hear me talk a little bit later in the, in the uh, presentation about the long-term athletic development model. There's going to be a chart coming up and some slides that will kind of break down by age group, um, what they should be doing, what they should not be doing, how often they should be doing it, how long they should be doing it, how much they should be doing, and all kinds of things like that. Um, and we want to make sure that you know, we use the proper equipment. And we'll talk about, there's going to be a list of questions that we're going to kind of answer and go through, through the, the slides that are going to come up. And it, I forgot to say, if anyone has any questions, feel stop me, throw something at me whatever, I will answer your questions as, as much as I can and as well as I can, all right? So that little baby right there, I don't think he's probably efficient to do that uh, not yours, activity. Not, he's, not mine. Mine show up later. They're kind of weird. Um, so these are the kinds of questions we're going to talk about with this presentation. So the first one is, what are the current recommendations regarding exercise and activity? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about what are the risks associated with, st with strength conditioning. We'll dispel some common myths. Um, we'll talk about things that you know, could happen, how to prevent those things from happening. Um, what are our benefits of using a, a, a designed and well-structured strength conditioning program to help you know, enhance an individual's overall performance, enhance their overall lifestyle, and things like that. We'll talk about when it's safe to you know, dive into free weight training. Uh, uh, against maybe just resistance bands or just body weights or when when is it safe to begin like Olympic lifting whether it be hang clings, push jerks, snatches, anything like that. Um, we'll talk about the exercises that should be performed and how they're age appropriate and what level they should be done at. Um, and then how often can you strength train and condition a young athlete. Um, so we'll, we'll hit all those topics like I said if any of these spark questions feel free to raise your hand or just stop me and, and we'll, we'll answer your questions. Right. So current recommendations on activity. So if we look at what the American Academy of Pediatrics says, is they currently recommend that school-aged children, youth should uh, perform at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity every day. Um, and that goes back to me being kind of, why are we taking PEs out of PE out of school when we need to have kids move, and they need to exercise, and they need to do these things. Um, it's, it's essential to growth and development, um, how they're going to develop their, their motor skills. Um, I mean, my daughter, she's six now, and she, we call her kind of baby giraffe because she's kind of tall and awkward and she kind of goes all over the place. So being able to just go out and play and do activity, your, your body will, like I said, it adapts, it adjusts to things, it makes yourself, um, it puts extra stress on your body, but then, like I said, you learn to adapt. If we take a look at what we call a neurocognitive development model, so if we take a newborn, they lay on their back. Well, they're smart enough to figure out eventually that I gotta lift my head up and kind of turn to get myself off my back, onto my side, onto my belly. So we have to, we, like I said, we, being able to develop and grow those types of skills and patterns are essential to life. We don't learn those things just by, oh, it's, I'm six years old and this is what I need to do. It's, it's gained over time. Um, Physical activity during the pediatric years can assist in developing a lifelong uh, activity regimen. Um, we talk about now in the current state we're in, you know, with the COVID virus, you know, people that are have comorbidities, so heart disease or kidney disease or hypertension or things like that, they're more at risk for getting those types of infections. I mean, those people will probably get the flu more often, they'll catch you know, strep throat more often. So, by doing more physical activity, our immune system increases, so we're able to fight things off a little bit better. Um, activity is always something that is great to kind of you know, boost not just your physical, but your mental. So there's, there's studies that show that kids that do more physical activity or exercise more often tend to do a little bit better in school. Um, it, it just kind of helps just give them a little bit more uh, 
exercise and activity to make that brain kind of function a little bit more, develop neural pathways and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is a big one for me. So children, allow them to free play. When I say free play, it's like just, just throw a ball out there or throw something out there and let them just run around and, and play. Watch them jump, watch them skip, watch them hop, and somersault, cartwheel. Even if it's not a cartwheel, they, they just kind of put their hands down and flip. Just let them play. It, that's, that's how they're going to learn, that's how they're going to develop. Um, and then, like I said, the body learns. It understands that, oh, if I you know, put my hands a little bit wider apart, maybe I can get my feet up in the air and I can flip over top of them. Um, and it, your body will refine those movements and it, it will come in much better. And with, with young children, it, never overcoach them. Don't ever overcoach them. Just let them, let them do things. It's, it's okay. Um, if you do overcoach them, you know, find one thing that you need to pick up on to help them improve their performance, and then kind of go with that. Don't overload them with sensory information and all that kind of stuff. You know, it, it, they can't process all that. So pick one thing if you're going to kind of help them and correct them that way. Um, and I'm a big proponent for not sports specializing. Um, there's research out there that shows it leads to chronic overuse injuries. So we have a lot of stress fractures, and we get a lot of kids that develop you know, osteoarthritis from repetitive trauma and repetitive injuries by doing the same movement patterns and the same sport movements over and over and over again. Uh, a, a really big one is if we look at the female population, and you know, club soccer's huge, and all they do is play soccer all year long. Well, female ACL rates are up eight to 12, times eight to 12 than they have been the last 20 years. So they're, they're growing because they're doing the same thing over and over again. I, I honestly and truly believe that kids that do multiple sports up until at least 16 years old will have a much better outcome. I mean, even if they're great at one sport and can specialize by the time they're maybe a junior or senior, they're better off than those kids that specialize so early. If we look at Little League Baseball, those kids' arms are shot by the time they're 15 or 16 years old because they're trying to throw so much and then they don't just pitch, so they may pitch and they may catch, and they may play third base, and they play center field. So they never truly get an off day. But if we look at major leaguers, that pitcher pitches one day, he gets four days off, and then he gets to throw again. Granted, he's throwing harder, he's got more velocity, but why are we treating a young arm differently than, than an arm that's older and well-trained? So, risks of strength and conditioning. Uh, the, the, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, yes. To your last point about specializing the athletes, I completely agree with you on multiple sports. Do you feel that applies to swimming as well? Yes. Um, I, I think swimmers, they swim a lot. I mean, I, I, am, I used to work high school level, um, and we would have swimmers that would go in the morning and get a lot of yards in or meters or whatever they swam in. Sometimes they come and say, I swim. 250 or 2,500 meters today, or I swim 5,000 yards today. That's a lot. And then they go back in the afternoon and they swim, you know, speed work, or, or they do just arms and they do just legs. Um, I think with swimming, what people really miss out on is the dry land training. So getting the strength training, the, the st stability work with that, through the core, the shoulder, um, the scapular thoracic region, um, even like the legs. I mean, they, they, they need to focus. A little bit more on like I said, dry land training where they can do. It doesn't have to be weight. It can be body weights. It can be bands. It can be medicine balls. It can be machine weights. Just something to break up the monotony of the repetitive training over and over and over again. I think that's that's the biggest thing with sports specialization is if we take let's take a soccer player for example, and they're used to receiving a ball a certain way, and it comes to them you know kind of the same every time. Well, let's say one time that ball doesn't come to them kind of like they're, they're used to. Their motor programs aren't ready to adapt to a quick change. Like they, can't, they can't do it because they've done it the same way for so long over and over again. So they're at higher risk for maybe an ankle injury, a hip injury, a knee injury, a back injury. Um, so I think the biggest thing is cross-training, just doing different things to get different programming done with your body. So say that ball comes at you a little differently, well, you play basketball and you moved that way before, you move that way again, it's, you're, you're ready for it. Your body's able to stabilize it, it's able to have the strength to, to handle those kinds of things. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. So, talking about risks of strength and conditioning. So, I know there's a lot of 
a couple myths out there that people always say, well, my kid shouldn't strength train because X, Y, or Z. Well, the number one myth is people think it stunts their growth. I'm here to tell you that there's been tons of research done out there. It does not stunt your growth. Um, it doesn't hurt your growth plates. It doesn't you know, close them up because you're loading it. But then again, if we look at, if we do it properly, and we insert the program the way it should be done, and we do it age appropriately, we're, we're not going to have any issues. And most of those growth plate or bone issues occur because two reasons. They were doing something inappropriate, so they weren't trained properly, or their, their program wasn't done right, or a kid was just goofing around and they got hurt. Um, so the biggest thing that we need to do is make sure that you know, kids do the right thing, and it's age appropriate, and that the person that supervises is making sure that everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing and doing it correctly. The other one is soft tissue injuries. You know, oh, my kid will get a muscle strain or they'll hurt their back or something in their back because they're lifting weights. Well, they won't do it if they're doing it properly. So if we, again, I'm going to keep pointing back to, we need to make sure that we do it age appropriate. We need to make sure that we uh, do the proper form and we coach that up and we teach it. We don't want to load things if someone can't do it. So if someone, you want someone to squat, you have them squat down and they look like, oh, Bobber chopper all over. Well, we probably shouldn't have them hold any dumbbells or hold a uh, medicine ball or put weight on their back or anything like that. Let's clean up our movements before we load anything. That doesn't make any sense because if we're going to load a non functional pattern, we're setting ourselves up for tons of issues down the road back, hip, knee, ankle, anything. All right? So, things that can be done to reduce or mitigate the risks of injuries happening. Making sure we have a competent coach. So I know that the sports club here has a lot of personal trainers that are very well trained. They, they've taken national certification exams. They know how to teach kids the proper way to lift weights. They know how to teach kids the proper movements for those, those programs and stuff like that. And they know how you know how to develop a kid and take them from, you know, maybe you have a 10-year-old that wants to start doing some resistance training. All right, well, maybe we're not ready for free weights yet, but we can try medicine balls, or we can try exercise bands, and they know how to kind of progress them that way. So that's something that you want, always want to make sure, is make sure the coach probably should be certified or have a very strong background in exercise science or movement science or strength conditioning, athletic training, something that, that will carry some clout with, with people. Um, teaching proper technique and instruction, um, making sure that people know how to do the, the exercise properly and, and do it with proper form so that way we don't develop injuries. Um, and always make sure young kids, they like to horse around. They like to goof around a little bit, have fun, supervise. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about like what the ratio should be with, with the number of athletes with a supervisor, just so they can maintain safety and all that kind of stuff. Um, with younger kids, we always want to avoid max loads or near max lifts. Um, it doesn't make any sense. And for a couple reasons, they're going to you may max them out, which you never should do anyway when they're 12 years old, but guess what? They're still growing and developing, so that max is going to change from one time to maybe three months from now, and it may change again in three months from that time. So just never heavy resistance or max loads until you get to, a, you know, we'll talk about age appropriate, kind of that kind of stuff later, but just avoid that kind of training. Um, and then understanding like the development, what, what an individual can tolerate. Some of the things that you may ask them to do, they may just not quite be ready for. You may ask them to perform a lunge. Well, they can't lunge because when they step forward, their knee collapses in, or their torso leans forward. So we want to make sure that they can do, like I said, the movements properly, and, and make sure that they can develop those movements before we load those types of things. So our benefits of a strength conditioning program. Right. So. Yes, sir. Well, so uh, maybe I'll get to something like this later, or maybe I'll just say good talk to the professional. But I'm just curious, uh, I said I was 48, so 30 years ago when I was in high school and learning in college for lifting, are there lifts or techniques that today we've learned, oh, don't do that, right? I mean, I know, well, like going squat to parallel, I've heard is kind of, uh, you're kind of risking it there. I don't know, maybe that's just because I'm older, they tell me not to do that, or military press. Are there other things that we should, tell our kids that are asking young athletes to avoid? Sure. Um, squatting, I think, to parallel is fine um, because there's a couple reasons why. Number one, 
you want to work through that full range of motion. If you're not working through your full range of motion, you're not gaining the benefits. So you're not getting the muscles to work the way they should, effectively and efficiently. Um, can you give me a pass on that though? On I mean, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, if you get to like 75 degrees, we'll take okay. it. Um, and there may be some, you know, co comorbidities or some underlying conditions where a person should not squat past 90 degrees. So, you know, say you're working with maybe some older athletes, you know, like a 16 year old or 17 year old. Well, maybe unfortunately they had a knee arthroscopy and they maybe lost a little bit of their meniscus. They had to kind of trim it out. You know, maybe if they get to parallel, they can't, it hurts them. So we have to be able to modify and adjust those things to, to fit our individual. I mean, it's great to have a team program, but you also have to be mindful of the individual. Like some kids just can't do certain things, or they're not able to, so you have to adjust things. I mean, you can't, it can't be a cookie cutter. I, mean, I despise those types of programs and types of things. Can everyone do the same lifts? Yes, but can you modify it for certain people? Absolutely. Um, and then speak with military press, I know that they used to have a lot of people go behind the head. They've done away from it now because it causes a lot of shoulder impingement. So they'll keep it in front of the face. Um, and they've done more with dumbbells or kettlebells where it's a little bit more, you can control it a little bit better where if you were a straight bar, you know, you were kind of stuck in one spot. So there's, there's ways you can change that kind of stuff up. But yeah, I mean, exercise wise, they haven't said anything as like, Oh my goodness, we're not doing that anymore. Um, the biggest thing they always talk about is making sure that the form is proper um, and making sure it's done effectively and efficiently to minimize the risk of an injury or something happening to the individual where it's not safe. So safety is the biggest thing. And, it, and if you, you are doing something with someone and it doesn't look right, it's probably not feasible to be doing it. Um, it's, it's okay. I mean, there's things that I will try with people, like when I'm working with student athletes, and they'll do it because I think they're ready for it, and it'll look like, oh my goodness, a car crash on 275. We're scraping that one out of there, and we're going back to something else. All right? So it's just, it just like I said, there's, there's nothing that has been like, oh no, you're not doing that anymore. It's just based on individual kind of what you're looking for. Um, and it, it can be sport specific too. I mean. How many times do you see truly a soccer player in a deep squat position? So it's to parallel. Like, when is a, a soccer player ever in this position? They're not. So, I mean, it's okay to, to train the full range of motion, but maybe don't heavy load that, you know, maybe 50% of a max, and then you can go heavier within a controlled range. You know, maybe a soccer player's so here like this. You go a little bit lower so you get that strength within what their sport requires, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so our benefits. So we're gonna improve strength and coordination with the strength conditioning program. Obviously, if we're doing strength training, strength should improve. With your younger individuals, you're gonna see strength gains improve astronomically because it's something new for them. You, you've kind of created some chaos in their body, so for the first couple times, they're gonna look kind of weird and kind of awkward doing things, but then they're gonna, like, light bulb clicks on and away we go. So efficiency, proficient, right? And like I said, the coordination thing will come. And they'll learn and they'll adapt. Um, you'll improve muscle endurance. So you'll be able to do more you know, reps of an exercise as you progress through your strength and conditioning program. And depend on how you set it up. If it's, if it's more of a, an endurance sport, so say cross country or longer distance swimming, you know, maybe you want to do more high reps. So you'll increase the muscular endurance. And hopefully that translates to sports skill where they're able to swim faster, farther, and they're able to run farther under a shorter amount of time. Um, improving overall performance. So with a lot of the younger kids, you're gonna see maybe not growth in muscles because they haven't reached maturity or puberty yet. So the testosterone levels are pretty low. But like I said, the efficiency is gonna improve, their overall performance will improve, and a lot of it's going to be actually from the core region because they're gonna be able to gain better control of you know, the core musculature, the hip musculature to stabilize the whole body. Um, and anything with strength training, you wanna make sure someone has a very solid foundation throughout the core. So the, we always talk about, like in my profession, the core is, this, is the powerhouse. So everything evolves from here. If this is not stable, then our hips aren't stable. 
and then the knees aren't stable, and the ankles aren't stable. So the old saying is poop runs downhill, it runs downhill if this isn't strong. So this is the top of our hill. And the same goes as we go up. So if this isn't strong, our, sca our scapula thoracic region isn't very strong, which means our glenohumeral region isn't strong, our elbow. So it, it runs uphill too, I guess. So it depends on what part of the world you're in. Um, improving overall health. We talked about how it helps develop healthy lifestyles for lifelong exercise, de decreases diseases, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, improves bone strength and density. So this kind of goes back to the said principle we talked about earlier. So we're imposing it a demand. So we're imposing a demand on the body. And the bones have to be able to support that. Well, if, and this is just a fun tidbit for you. One cubic inch of bone is actually stronger than one cubic inch of concrete. So you could pile weight on top of one cubic inch of each of those, and the bone will win every time. If it's a strong bone, not a bone that's diseased or brittle or anything like that. Um, so by helping or loading just a little bit, and it can be through resistance bands or holding a medicine ball, or, you know, just lifting something up and setting it down, you're actually stressing the bones and, and helping them develop more strength. Um, reduce risk for injury, and then improving your self-image and self-confidence. The old adage is, you look good, you play good. If you look, feel like you're looking good, and you're probably going to feel a little bit more confidence about yourself. Um, you look at student athletes; a lot of them they carry themselves a lot, you know, a little more upright because they feel like I look good, I'm ready to go. And this is what we got to do. All right, so this is kind of a busy chart, I would say, but this is what I talked about earlier with the long-term athletic development model. So this will break it down into our age range, kind of what, we're, what we want to do, um, the stage where we're at, and, and the focus of what we're trying to accomplish with the strength conditioning program, all right? So the first stage, fundamentals, um, and with this being said, um, maturity levels between sexes are different. Um, females normally mature about two years before males do, um, physically. Um, and you also need to be aware of that there is a there could be a wide gap between six-year-old boys and six-year-old girls. So a six-year-old boy at one level, he may be performing at let's say an eight-year-old maturity level, or another one may not be to a six-year-old level, he may be a five-year-old or a four-year-old level. So there's even variability within the same age group, um, along with the, the sexes. Okay? Um, so in the fundamentals, if you can see the, the fun is all capitals. So we want this to be fun. We want it to be enjoyable. We want to teach kids that Moving is great. Doing exercise is good. Jumping jacks, uh, body weight squats, lunging, reaching down and picking something up using proper form, not bending over at the waist. And, and this is where you can make a huge impact on young kids by you know, helping them see that we, can, we gotta move well and we gotta do these things the right way and, and we can get better things. We can get faster and we can jump higher and all these kinds of things. Um, and our, our, our stage is a very fundamental weightlifting skill. So like I said, it's all body weight stuff at this age. And it's free play. Don't, we don't need to coach a whole lot here. Just let kids run, jump, hop, skip, everything. They're, they're going to develop that physical literacy that you're going to be able to build upon as they go through the development model. Right? So when we get males and females in the next stage learning to train, so males 9 to 12, females 8 to 11 years old, we can start to introduce strength resistance type training. And this can be, like I said, again, with medicine balls, it can be with bands, um, it can be with machine weights. And I would say be leery with machine weights because a lot of them are built for adults. They're not built for kids that are this age. Although there are companies that do make youth weight machines, which is a little bit safer because um, there's not so much uh, variability with, with free weight, or uh, the weight machine is with free weights. But I'm a very free weight person. Uh, I, I advocate for that all the time because you get a, another training effect from free weights. You have to be able to stabilize. So you get a little bit more training from this muscle stabilizers as well as the muscles that you're trying to enhance the strength and the power form, the endurance form. So anytime you can use implements instead of machines, so kettlebells, dumbbells, bands, medicine balls, anything like that, or they have to, again, stabilize through the core and make things solid and stable, I think you're getting a, a better benefit from that than machine weights. 
But this is where we start to teach the technical components of lifting. So we teach them how to squat properly. Chest up, heels stay flat on the floor, push our hips back as we go down. We want to make sure we do that. If we're going to you know, lunge, we want to make sure that we step forward and our, our front knee doesn't go in front of our front foot. We don't want our knee to collapse in. We want to make sure that we keep our torso upright, everything like that. So these are the things that we really start to teach. And once they master these just movement patterns, we can start loading. So like I said, we can add holding dumbbells or holding a medicine ball to your chest or something like that. All right. So when we get into training to win, so there's two stages here. And the reason kind of that there's two stages here is because of puberty and development. So kids, they're going to become awkward and then they're going to get really good and then they might become awkward again and they'll get really good. Um, and don't be discouraged if a kid was strong for a little while and all of a sudden their strength kind of falls off a little bit. It's probably because they're growing. So we know that muscles grow, or bones grow a little bit faster than muscles. So those muscles have to try and catch up to those bones. So you've, been, you've put a longer lever in with a shorter muscle. So it doesn't know how to move that longer lever. It doesn't know how to control it. It doesn't have the same strength. Um, and fun fact is, the longer your levels are, actually the stronger you should be. So the taller people technically should be stronger because they have the ability to bind more of their muscle fibers to generate more force, more torque, more power. That's why you see a lot of the bodybuilders are just tall, huge guys. Um, even like a weight, Olympic, uh, weightlifters in the Olympics, they're big, tall people. They're long and they can generate all that power. So anyway, training to win in one and two, You'll, you'll kind of bounce back and forth between what we call the technical aspect of, of what strength training, strength conditioning, which is teaching the movement. You may have to reteach them how to squat after they grow. You may have to reteach them how to you know, lift something over their head and press it. You may have to teach them how to lunge again properly. Because like I said, they, they get awkward. Right? And then the secondary component is performance. So improving our strength, improving our power, improving our endurance, improving all these things. And like I said, you can switch back and forth kind of in this training to win area. So if they've really mastered the movement, you can start adding more load and increasing the weight and things like that. You can play around with sets and you can play around with reps and all kinds of stuff. And then if we get to the end stage training to compete, they've mastered how to do the movement. They've, there's no, they've probably done growing. They're not going to get taller or anything like that. You get those few cases where you know, a boy that's 16 years old goes to 18 and then all of a sudden he grows a senior year four inches. Unbelievable, it's crazy. But when they get to 16 for males, 15 for females, they're pretty much done growing based on research. Um, so you can start, at, so if they've got the movement patterns down and know how to do the lift properly, let's load it, let's add weight, let's make them Depending on what their, their sport is, what their activity is, you know, if we have a, a soccer player, they're going to kind of go through a strength phase with a little bit of endurance to be able to withstand you know, 90 minutes of a soccer match. If we have a football player, they need to be able to do short, quick bursts. Baseball catchers, we need to be able to have them you know, have a lot of endurance, especially in the, in the lower extremity. They're going to squat down for a long time. We need to be able to generate power from out of that position to stand up and throw down to second base or throw a guy out. Um, so it's just, you have to really look at what the activity is the individual is taking part in, what their sport is, kind of what their position is, and kind of group your kids together that way, and then you can kind of develop your plan and your program based on that. Not that they all can't do the same lifts, but you may want to, like I said, alter, you know, this, if they're more lower body dominant, maybe a little bit more heavy on the squats or lunges or anything like that. Um, if they're more of an upper body sport, we want to make sure we work a little bit more on the shoulder girl and things like that. So if we look at kind of the prescription guidelines that we're going to use, so this, this chart here breaks it down into what our stages were. Right? So our ages. If we look at the total number of reps we're going to do for each stage, um, it will depend kind of on what our goal is for this. When we look at the fundamental level, pretty much you can say 
they're going to do six to ten exercises, a lot of body weight stuff, whether it be push ups, sit ups, planks, body weight squats, lunges, stuff like that. And probably anywhere from two sets to three sets of 10 to 12 to 15 reps. Um, and this is where you can kind of play around with, you know, if, if you want to get kind of a, know where a kid is at developmental wise, you know, have them do number of push ups until they can't do it without proper form. And then you, know, you have them go through the program and then they come back and maybe they do five more. So you've designed your program properly, you've done, done a good job. Okay. And the frequency of, of this stage is, is one to two times a week. It doesn't take more than that. Um, and you wanna make sure that they're able to recover. Uh, but like I said, kids are like rubber bands, they're very resilient, they bounce back really quickly. Um, but you don't wanna have it so focused and centered. Like I said, free play is the best thing for kids this age. Just let them get out and run and jump and play. Um, when we get into learning weightlifting, our volume decreases, so we're going to decrease our reps a little bit. We're going to decrease our exercises a little bit because we want to try and train and teach the exercise properly so then we can start to load that exercise. Right? Our intensity, we're going to go 30 to 50 percent of a one repetition max and a lot of times what I tell people is we're not going to one rep max these kids. So what we're going to do is probably take their body weight and take 30 to 50% of that. That's what we'll add to their, their exercise. Okay, so say a kid, for lack of a better term, say a kid weighs 100 pounds and he wants to, you know, we're going to do bench press. Well, you can put 30 pounds on his chest and go that way. At the low end, he's really strong, 100 pound in, try 150 pounds. Or 50 pounds on, because um, that will that will give him a little bit more load. Um, recovery can be a little bit shorter here, because they're starting to develop through puberty and get a little bit more testosterone and things like that to help uh, restore muscle um, degradation. Sorry about that. Um, and our frequency is still one to two days a week. Um, when we get into training or weightlifting, we're going to decrease our reps a little bit more because we're really going to maybe start adding some more load. Total exercises again, three to six. Our intensity increases, so we can go from 50%. And those are going to be more of our endurance athletes, that you know, cross-country kids, our long-distance swimmers. Um, even depends on where you're at in your season. Maybe some soccer teams will be more of an endurance. You know, if they're in season, instead of strength and power, that they'll do a little bit more off-season work on. Um, frequency, you can go a little, a couple more days a week, and the recovery is about 48 hours. Then we get into our last stage. We're really going to decrease our reps because these people are training for performance. Uh, we're gonna increase our intensity, exercise total is still two to five, and these are pretty much like big exercises. So we're doing squats and lunges and things like that. We're gonna keep it pretty two to five that way, but you can do some auxiliary things, you know, with some bands, you know, hip exercises where you're doing abductors and extension and all kinds of stuff. Right? I know it's a busy slide. Anybody have any questions kind of like prescription guidelines or anything? So, and this is just kind of a lot of the stuff that I start with people, because um, I get, you know, I have some young kids that I work with a lot of, uh, so we do a lot of body weight stuff. Um, push-ups are great, um, and if they can't do them, you know, like a normal push-up, it's okay to put them on their knees, or it's okay to have them do push-ups on the wall, or if it's, a, it's okay to have them do it, you know, on a table where they're here, kind of inclined, where it's a little bit more stressed, but just, Try to find something that they can do and do it do it properly and do it right. Um, pull-ups are great. If they can't do pull-ups, I'm terrible at pull-ups and I'm up on 40 years old. Um, but you can have them do flex arm hang. You can have them just get up over the top of the bar and hang over top of it. Um, if you're lucky enough to have weight training equipment like a power rack, you can have bands that can help people, you can put them across and you can have kids put their feet on it or their knees and it will help lift them or raise them as they do pull-ups. So there's ways you can vary that kind of stuff. Um, planks are great. It's going to develop your, your spinal musculature. It's going to develop your abdominal, your core muscul musculature. Uh, and you can vary that too. You can do it from the knees. You can do it on the side. You can do it, you know, where you're like this and you're, you're reaching with one arm or you're lifting one leg up off the ground. You can go from a high plank to a low plank. There's all kinds of progressions you can do to make things a little bit more difficult, a little bit more easier, just depending on who you're working with and kind of what they need. Back extensions, you know, you lay on the floor and you 
extending up, um, squats, body weight. Start with body weight, make sure they can squat right. Make sure they're not shifting to one side, making sure they're getting their hips back behind them. Um, when they can do all that kind of stuff well, maybe they hold a medicine ball or they hold a kettlebell. Maybe you can put a band around their shoulders and they can stand on it. Something to add a little bit of external load. Lunges the same way, dips, you can do bench dips, you can do normal dips, um, just to kind of work the body that way. I mean, just anything to kind of get the muscles excited and, and moving and working is, is what we're looking for with our body weight stuff. So this is kind of where we start in that fundamental stage with our strength training. All right. Exercise progression, so as an individual progresses physically and emotionally, more complement, complex exercises can be introduced. So these are more of like our power exercises, so pain cleans, power cleans, um, snatches, jerks, clean and jerks, push presses. Um, those are very multi-joint exercises, so you're using your total body to try and move weight, lift something. Um, so you want to make sure that they have a solid foundation. If they can squat properly, they can do a back squat or a front squat, uh, making sure that they can hold the weight with their arms and stabilize themselves. We always want to make sure that strength training, if you're going to use it, try and make it consistent, especially when you get, you know, kids that are a little bit older. Um, detraining, when I say detraining, loss of muscle strength or endurance or anything like that, actually can happen within two days if you don't train in two, two days. So that's why the, the rest time is decreased as we kind of move through the long-term athletic development model. Um, and it takes almost two weeks to get those gains back that you may have lost. So if you skip week of weight training or strength training, it's going to take you almost six weeks to gain everything back that you had built up. Um, I, I know it sounds crazy, but it, it is. I mean, okay, there's, it's not crazy, it's just yeah. Insane. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there are, there's a neurological component where your, your body has to relearn how to do certain movements and how to move those weights and stuff like that. So if you're going to introduce it, you know, just make sure that you're, you're consistent with it and make sure that it, everyone is taking part. So program considerations, we want to make sure, again, we teach proper form, technique. Uh, we want to make sure that we are using proper spotting techniques. Uh, and like I said, here at the sports club, the trainers will help you. Uh, you want to make sure that your coaches are there and they're ready to, to help and instruct and teach. Uh, a lot of times we use the ratio of 10 athletes or 10 participants to one coach. They can kind of keep an eye on kids that way. The other thing is that the kids teaching them how to spot and correct, or not correct, but help an individual in trouble is essential. So you want to make sure that they understand the, the rationale of, you know, you need to pay attention in the weight room, you need to pay attention to what's going on, so that way you don't get hurt, you don't hurt someone, and we end up with an injury. Um, the training area should be free from hazards, so no wet floors, no people running around that are horse around, playing around, and stuff like that. Make sure that the equipment's clean, especially in this day and age. Uh, make sure that it's safe. You know, in, inspect your, your weight plates, inspect your bars, make sure everything's tight. Inspect your, you know, your, your benches or your racks to make sure that nothing is going to fail and, and a kid will get hurt that way. You always want to make sure you have goals that, for what you want to accomplish. And if you want strength to happen, you know, it's, it's maybe three to five sets of lower reps, but a higher weight. You want more endurance to happen? Maybe it's two to three sets of you know, uh, ten to fifteen reps at a, at a lower weight. Um, so you always want to make sure that your your program is fit for what you want to accomplish. Like I said, when you have young kids starting, have them do push-ups for you know the, until they can't do them, anymore. and that's their goal is to do more push-ups or more, you know have them do squats for a certain amount of time. If they can't do that that many that number of time, then that's our goal, we're gonna reach that goal. If we get to older kids, you know, they wanna increase their, their max by 10 pounds. Well, the only way we're gonna increase is we gotta lift heavier. Or the kid wants to be able to do more reps. Well, we gotta increase our, our reps that way. Um, we talked about making sure the equipment is sized and best fit for the group you're training. Like I said, um, bands, medicine balls for younger kids are great, dumbbells, kettlebells. Uh, machines aren't perfect because they don't, they're, they're, cookie cutter, they're not one size fits everyone, they're one size fits all. Be sure that you understand the maturity level of the athletes that you're training. So kids will be kids, they'll goof around, they'll horse play and all that kind of stuff. So just kind of keep them in check. 
and make sure, again, you assess your program to make sure that you're, you're gaining as a coach or a, a parent or a teacher what you want out of it. Um, and this is just something that we do at, at Beacon. Um, it's a functional movement screen, and a lot of our kids that I get, I get them after they've either had surgery, they've had an injury or something like that, where they're gonna probably develop maybe a compensatory pattern or have a dysfunction or have an asymmetry as they return to sport. So we put all of our people that come through me up through a functional movement screen. It's a series of seven, just very basic movements. We look at how you squat, how you step, how you lunge, how you lift your leg, how you reach your arms, uh, how you stabilize through your core. And what we do is if we don't move well with our screen, we gotta fix those things before we can move on. So we're not gonna load a dysfunctional pattern. We're not going to train a dysfunctional pattern. We're gonna fix those things and make sure people can do them properly and correctly before we're going to progress them. Um, and there's individuals throughout the city that, that are able to do functional movement screens. I, I think up in the facility here with Trihealth, I think they do some of the functional movement screen stuff. Um, I'm not familiar, I don't know if the sports club here does any of the, the functional movement training stuff on the screens. Um, but it, all this stuff is based on how development happens. And their motto is to move well before you move often. So if we're moving often but not moving well, we're probably going to develop issues further down the line and not get the most bang for our buck training wise. We're not going to get our strength that we want. We're not going to get our endurance we want, our power, or anything like that. So moving properly or moving well before we move often is, is a big thing to do. Oh, I skipped on through that. That's crazy. So they said to try weight lifting. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun, and this is what happened. No, I'm just kidding. But does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, yes, about like periodization and things like that. Um, the children, uh, older, like say you know, 16 year old and above, that sort of thing. So I did. Yeah. So it's going to be based on sport and what time of year they're in. Um, so if you're looking. So what kind of sport are we talking about? Uh, well, any sport, but I'm interested in soccer. In soccer, yeah. okay. So soccer predominantly is a very, it's a fall season. We look at kind of high school setup, college setup, things like that. I know that they play year long with club and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but what your periodization is kind of going to look like is, is your preseason. So let's, we'll break down the calendar from January. So January probably until, let's say March it's probably going to be more of a heavy dose of endurance mixed with a little bit of strengthening. Um, so maybe 8 to 12 reps of activity, three, two to four sets of an exercise, um, you know, maybe five to eight exercises happening. You know, maybe your 60 to 75 percent load. So you're kind of building the base right there because you've kind of tore yourself down through the season. You know, it ends maybe November. You get December off kind of an active recovery time to kind of just recover and things like that. You hit March, April, May, you're kind of going to maybe increase your percentages, maybe 70 to 80, 85% with, with your maxes. Um, and kind of live there throughout the summer a little bit, maybe undulate it a little bit where you might increase to 85, 90%, maybe the month of June uh, or July, maybe you get more into a little bit more sport specific type of skills. So, in the, the oh, rules, I'm sorry, the April, May, you said percentage, but what about um, uh, rep quantity? So, I would probably go like three to five sets, and maybe three to five reps. If the heavier you go, you're going to want to decrease your reps. Um, so, that's, that's kind of where I would live there with the, the major exercises, so like squatting, benching. If you're doing any type of power, like cleans or snatches or anything like that, um, which is like three to five reps. Three to five reps yeah. in, the, in the summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like if we're coming into like April, May, when we get to June and July, we're going to bump our reps back up and decrease our percentage a little bit because you're probably going to get into more like tactical training with your team, um, where you get to more sport specific stuff. So, and then in season, you know, you may lift once or twice a week based upon your practice schedule, your game schedule. Uh, and, and that's going to be more of a maintenance thing. So you're going to probably go 50 to 70% of max, uh, three sets of 
eight to twelve reps just to kind of maintain what you what you've built throughout the season. Um, and the the r good rule of thumb is you know is if you're getting more heavy sport specific, maybe decrease your your volume and your loading like strength training wise. If you're not so much focused on sport specific skill acquisition, then then you can make some huge gains in the weight room, like strength training wise, conditioning wise, and all that kind of stuff like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No? I'd like to thank you for yeah. settling the conversation you <laughs> had about the importance of order. Oh, and now I will. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you. These are my munchkins probably like three year, two or three years ago. We, we did a lot little strength, light strength training, dumbbells. That's awesome. Yeah. They are not that little anymore. They're, they're big. But yeah. And then if you guys, these are some references I use, so feel free if you want to take a picture of it or anything like that, you're more than welcome to. Um, all of it is stuff you can find on the web. They're all free articles. Um, so you can, you can fact check me if you will. <laughs> and this is being recorded, so it should be posted on the Google Sports website. Very cool. Um, the it'll be sent to those who signed up, so. Okay. Well, I'm, I guess I'm officially signed up. Um, I'm Emily Warden. I'm our swim coach, okay. swim pro, kids fitness, high piper of children around here. Awesome. What are the chances I could get a print out of that? Of the, the yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. Thank you so Absolutely. much. For yeah, sure. I'll write down. I have yeah, a club. You can. Uh, yeah, I'm a part of the Cincinnati Sports Club. Yeah, oh, I got yeah. to write down. Yeah. Or, you yeah. Know. yeah. Absolutely. COVID. I forgot I'm not supposed to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, but thank you guys for coming. Yeah. Hopefully it was informative and yeah. helped you out. Yeah.